Okay. And I'm going to. There's still time to change your name on the cover slide to Hubert Farnsworth. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 gonna that, that, gonna that. I guess I'm I'm recording and I'm I am recording. Yep, looks like it. Okay, cool. So shall we get started? So welcome everybody, and I think everybody is has been to our pirates before. Um, thank you for being here. Today's our pirates is a little bit different because it's not specifically about R. It's it's about a, a Linux shell skill, which is very helpful to, to our people. Before I, before I launch into it, how many people have heard of the term shell expansion before? Actually heard it, but Jay's like, sort of like, well, well maybe. <laughs> um, and so, but I, I guarantee that you've probably actually uh, experienced it. So, are you going to do one of these for a Windows shell expansion? <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Is that Windows spell W I N G O Z E? Because uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, if it's a win if it's for dummies, that's where most of those guys are. So, I I I. I so this applies to those Windows users who are using R uh, via R Studio server on the cluster. Yep. So, um, and and I should let you know that, that I'm going to make these slides available uh, so they're easily accessible via the event page, and and probably I will make them available through the R Pirates page uh, on the Idea website. So these are. Um, uh, I, I kind of put these slides together with that in mind. Um, so the idea here is that uh, shell expansion is this this nifty trick that lets you uh, shortcut things, do do things easier. You're you're probably all familiar with this idea of using asterisk, like when you do when you want to list all your text files, or or if you're R users, you want to list all your RDS files. Okay. And you go ls star dot rds. Okay. Um, but shell expansion is more than that. Shell expansion is is a whole set of syntax which lets you uh, a, 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 not just abbreviate, but sort of create these like little uh, little functional uh, expansions of, of what you're trying to do. And we'll we'll step through that. And and what we're going to do, I'm going to show examples that use. The Linux echo command because it's kind of a nifty way to sort of test and and, and illustrate how these work um, and also to sort of it, it emphasizes how uh, kind of how commands work in the shell um, and we'll we'll get through that and and there's different kinds uh, there's things like uh, the asterisks which are path name expansions there's there's braces using the uh, curly braces. There's uh, simple things like the tilde, which I think we're familiar with. Uh, uh, the variable expansion, which you've seen if you've ever had to do uh, environment variable uh, definitions, uh, variable expansion, and how the, the symbology of how you invoke environment variables, uh, it, they, you'll see that they comes into that. And also substituting commands, and, and even something which was kind of a surprise to me, this notion of uh, arithmetic expansion, how you can actually slide in uh, uh, arithmetic expressions into your commands. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of zip through that and, uh, and and talk through these different examples. Um, and as I said, we're gonna use echo in in showing these examples. And here's our our first example of you know, using echo. Uh, echo simply repeats what you've put in. So here it's you know, echo hello world and it comes back with hello world. Uh, but let's let's do a couple of different kinds of path name ex extensions. Here um, is the asterisk, which you're familiar with, is just 
uh, show me any match, um, uh, any number of characters. So complete words. So uh, asterisk. Asterisk.txt is the example uh, I'm using here. We see the syntax for that. And this is kind of a, a, a funny thing uh, and, and kind of interpreting these examples is a little bit weird. Keep in mind, if you're, if you're trying this at home, if, you were, if you're sitting there trying to type in these commands as I'm doing this, or if you're trying to check me, if you take these slides and, and, and BS check me on, on my work, uh, <clears throat> You'll, you'll find that this might not work, okay? And then uh, it was a little bit of an eye-opener to me when I was actually BS checking myself. I, I typed this into a particular directory. I think it was like my home directory on, on the, the cluster because I tested these on the cluster and nothing came back. I'm like, did I just, you know, is, is my complete set of slides bad? Is there something weird? Um, is, it, is Echo somehow not installed? And no, it was it was really stupid. You know, these I had like no .txt files in my in the directory I tested that. So, so as Professor Farnsworth says, um, you, for these examples, it, it's got to exist. Is it doing that? Sorry, guys. Okay. So this is this is where it gets really kind of interesting, and this is where so when you look at these examples, think not just about things that you might type into, uh, you might hand into the command line, but also think if you're putting together shell scripts to sort of uh, that you're going to you're going to source at the, the Linux shell to do some kind of file manipulation, you know, some, which uh, which is really the context to be thinking about this. These are ways to kind of economize how you're going to do that instruction. So what what this brace notation is essentially doing it's it's sort of like a um, I hesitate to say it, but it's sort of like doing a for loop, and it's going to uh, so typing an echo file. Uh, it's going to in this brace it's going to substitute in what you've got in the, between those braces. It's going to so it's essentially going to give you. Um, file one dot txt, file two dot txt, file three dot txt. Now, in this situation, all it's doing is generating text. That's all. It's it's simply generating this text. So this is not doing any because we're using the echo command. It's not doing anything at the file system. <clears throat> but you can get really creative uh, with this. Uh, so we've we've asked it to. We put a couple of these brace notations together, and what is it done? It's just giving you a, all these different combinations. Think creatively how you might use this in some kind of a script. Uh, you could use this to either search for like a whole block of files uh, very economically, um, and you could, following this model, you could you could preface it with some some expression. So. Uh, this is this brace notation. Yeah. Yeah. Just and feel free to ask questions. Syntactic question, I guess. Like if you had put a space between the closing brace after C and the open brace after one, would it have printed out A, B, C, one, two, three, instead of like all combinations of those two things? Like, I'll try it. I okay. think because it doesn't seem like intuitive to me that that would be nesting like uh, I I um so I don't know the answer on okay. um, whether um, and I think the answer might be different if you wrapped this in quote, double quotes or not. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, it is cool functionality. It just like the fact that that has applied as like a sort of a nested loop, right? Where it goes a and then loops through one, two, three. Yeah, there's a there's definitely a precedence set. Yeah, that is doing, and it's a a a a b b b c c c. I got a quick question yeah. also. Uh, so, can we include a number in place of C? Can we put a number in place of C? Is what would that mean? Because this is this is doing a sequence. Oh, okay. This is sequence notation. This is actually uh, this is the same as you. you this is equivalent to uh, like R's sequence notation. If you're doing, if you did like. Um, um, if you're doing a for loop, 
Yes. In in R, and you said for for I in A colon C, it's gonna it's gonna your I is gonna be A B C. Okay. So this kind of is equivalent to that sort of sequence notation. So this wants to be a sequence. Oh. And you know what would it mean to go from A to one? So, so it, was, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Break, right? Well, yeah, it, it doesn't make any sense because you can't do a sequence like that. It's just, yeah. Yes. Is there a question? No. <clears throat> All right. So, till the expansion, I think we've, uh, those of us in, in data analytics research, we've, uh, we often have you like, CD to tilde yes. before we have you do something. Okay, go to your go to your home directory. Right. But um, and so when you say echo that, that's 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 a shortcut for uh, the home directory. But this is interesting. You go tilde. Uh, if you did tilde Eric J four on the um, on the cluster, it's going to show the the home directory for me. And I didn't realize that that it, that it worked that way. Can I can I add something? Because yeah, I'm testing it. So, uh, I mean, you mean on this this? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, the, uh, this back, this one. So if you put a space between the two for uh, curly brace things, yeah, it will it won't nest them? So it do A B C then one two three. Okay, that makes sense. But because each one of those is like a command. Yeah, but you can do a. I just tried this for grins. I did echo curly open curly brace one. Dot dot five dot dot two, and it outputs one three five. Yeah, that makes sense. By twos, so you can add it. Oh yeah, so that's cool. Uh, there you go. Keep adding dots. Yeah, that's, that's the next test. Okay, so 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 kind of in the, the same kind of the same line as the as the tilde. Um, I'm, I'm for, I, I missed the missed the thing. This is supposed to be a, the the dollar sign here. Um, the way I think of this is when I want to call a variable uh, in the in the shell, I use the, the the dollar sign. So I'm calling this this home variable, and it's going to echo that back. Um, we're going to show how we actually use that by I'm I'm going to create another variable called name. I'm going to call it. Now, because I'm doing this in, um, I'm, I'm kind of building this, this, this expression. I've got to do a couple of things. It's, it's going to, uh, uh, going to instantiate it in this string that I'm having it echo. Uh, and I'm going to refer to it. I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing the indirection there by having the, the outside curly bracket. And we've got other examples of how we do this pound curly bracket, or sorry, dollar sign curly bracket in another slide. So if you put all and roll this all together, you're going to get this uh, this string. But but Professor Farnsworth doesn't agree. Actually John's home directory is Eric J4. Yeah. So it's uh, it's similar to like extract extracting a column from a data frame. So it's similar to that. The dollar sign. No, no, no. That 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 you're you're confusing R. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Uh, the dollar sign. The dollar sign in Linux. I mean, so the dollar sign in R is how you call uh, how you refer to a child object. Okay. So if I've got object foo and I've got a a column or some other child object in the foo, in foo that's called bar, I would do foo dollar bar. Okay. And if I got a child object in that, there's another dollar sign. So when you've got a named child object in R, you're referring to it. Uh, so this this uh, dollar sign is a totally different thing. This is just that. Yeah, basically, that means I want the value to exist. That's exactly what it means. Yeah. This is this is a this is a shortcut for. Um, this is how you do what they're calling variable expansion. So this is how we're instantiating. And and typically, and you'll, you'll see this used all over the place in, in your shell scripts when you've got, uh, particularly if your shell script is meant to pull in, well, everything does it, you know, uh, uh, Linux code all over the place when it's calling 
uh, when it needs to call environmental variables, the way you refer to the environmental variables, you'll always recognize it in the scripts as dollar sign something. Like, like where your Java is located is dollar sign Java, or where your Python is located is dollar sign Python. Oh, right. So, so John, you mentioned in, in R, the dollar sign means something different. Is that kind of equivalent to the ampersand does in Linux? It's like well, no, that, a pointer or something? Well, not not quite. I mean, that's in a in a loose sense. It's it's just that in in R, the dollar sign is. I mean, it's it's just exactly it's it's. So in R, there's a couple ways to look inside of an object to get the child of the object. Okay, one like if we're simply thinking of a data frame, uh, when you want to refer to the child object, which in a data frame is a column. You would refer to that column name as it's like if if it's data it's df your data frame dollar foo okay um, but in R you can also index into the object numerically you could you could you could you can refer to that object in the, in a different way so it's a um, in a way it's it's sort of a it's like an expansion uh, it's it's a a, a, a syntactical thing in R to make it easier to do it, and and it's consistent all the way through. So as I said before, if you've got multiple child objects, if, if it's a nested object, you would refer to it that way. Sometimes you don't have named children in an R structure, and in those cases, you you have no choice but to index it specifically. But but those might have a child themselves. Uh, it, and in a lot of it, it kind of depends on how the object is constructed. If you look at some of the code, some of the code I've written, it's 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 crazy that you've got like a couple levels of dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign that an index and some more dollar signs to get to this thing that I've got deep buried in the bowels of the data frame. Uh, the, the structure I shouldn't call it necessarily data frame. So here, um, so you have to pay. Careful attention to uh, things like back ticks and, and symbology, how you're referring to how you refer to commands. Okay, so um, and this this is this can be a little bit confusing. So date, the word date is a command. Go to your Linux shell and you type in date. Um, you're gonna get the date back. So if I'm writing a script, and I, um, and like for example, if I want to, if I want to have a file name that has the date in it, how do I, how do I access that? How do I specify that? That's what this is about. This so what you know. So I'm creating this string. I'm going to echo this string. Today's date is, and I need to substitute in that date. So. You don't do it by dollar sign date because dollar sign date is looking for a variable named date. You would refer to it. You're saying, run this command. So it's put the result of this command into the uh, into my string, and that's what you see. And I think this is the one where I've got several examples. Yeah, I played with this to see the different results. So. And I'm sorry I didn't highlight it. So I just typed date. Yeah, I get the date out. Then I did dollar date. I mean, no, I used the symbology that I used to put it in that string. And it's but look at what it came back with. That it was a bash, it was a shell error. And it said, I don't understand this command to T U E. Why did it do that? Okay. Well, what's what's today's date? Well, what's the date that I did this Tuesday? So what it what this did is it instead of using the command date, it used the result of it, the result of running date as the command, and the result of running the date command is Tuesday. <laughs> okay, then we've got. 
uh, essentially what we did in this example, except just the, this. So now what it's doing is it's echoing that result and you get that answer. And then, um, so that's with double quotes. And this is, this is meant to, to emphasize there's a difference between, there's sometimes a difference between double quotes and single quotes. So here what we see is with the double quotes, it's, it's executing that. With the single quotes, or backticks as they call it, it is, it's echoing that back literally. So this is a situation where I don't want it to run this and, and provide the string. I want it to actually include this, this literal thing. Okay, so, and so we see that's what came back on the command line. So if we go here, now this is where it's getting really funky, and I and and frankly, it's it's kind of um, this is definitely stuff that you're not going to be doing manually at the command line. This is stuff that you're you're creating funky file names or you're doing something, and uh, and you're having to include mathematical expressions, uh, arithmetic expressions in. So how do I? So uh, I, I can't remember exactly what my example was, but but you can translate this before. This is sort of like if you if you cover up this, you see what we had in a previous slide: the the dollar sign parentheses, parentheses, and then we're wrapping that with parentheses, and that's knows to substitute in that value uh, the var that thing. <clears throat> We can we can do it either with the literal values or we can do it obviously with with variables. Um, so uh, yes. Oh, never mind. Never mind. I just look. Yeah, it's right there. I just looked below. But yeah. So so your your the so the question is kind of like what's what's the point of this and and this is kind of what I said. These sorts of things come in handy when you are uh, creating shell scripts that are trying to do some sort of manipulation. Typically, why, why are we doing shell scripts out in the Linux? What? Go ahead. So uh, I'm just curious. What happens if we remove one pair of brackets? Why there? Why, why? Well, it's it's so yeah. If you if you remove one pair of brackets, what are you telling it? Yeah, you're you're asking the yeah. shell. To do this, yes. Okay, you're, you're, this is you're asking the shell to do this. If you type five plus three into the Linux shell, it's going to barf. That's because that's that's literally what 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 you're doing. If you if you get if you if you're giving it this command, but you get rid of one set of this, what this translates into, what this expands into, this is about shell expansion, is. Um, Execute the command five plus three in the Linux shell, and and substitute that into this this expression. And if you type five, you know the Linux shell is not the Google search interface, which goes, oh, they typed in five plus three, so I'm going to turn that into math today. You know, so um, although I'm not sure now that they do AI in there, I'm not sure what it's going to do. They say five plus three is twelve. Um, so. Anyways, so this you, this will these are answers to questions of if I've got some funky data transformation shell script that I write to do magic, uh, how do I do math in my funky shell script that's doing doing things? Okay, okay. Um, now we saw it. so given that we've seen how to do expansion, how do we how do we Prevent it from doing expansion. You know, how do we write in our in our scripts? How do we force it not to to do certain things? And we saw a hint of that before. So, uh, for example, if we do when we had echo home, it it does expansion. The variable I get, I, I see the home directory. If I use single ticks, single ticks say to do the literal. So literally echo back. Dollar home, and we saw that in that other example with the the date command, it, it, or the 
where I've tried to do that, the expansion of the date plan. Okay. Um, you, with double quotes, you sometimes have it, you sometimes don't. Okay, here uh, you see that, uh, and, and I could have included this, if you remember the example earlier in the slides, I had a string and then I stuck in that dollar home. Okay, and that's, and so we see that there. Um, you also have, like you have everywhere else, you have uh, escape characters, which is this, the, the backslash. And so what this is, is the same as if I had just done, you know, think of, if I just type echo home, it would have just echoed home. I would just see echo home. Well, how to, one way to make it do this is, you know, where to get that result is just say, well, giving it the string, but I wanted to ignore the, the dollar sign. I'm, I'm going to escape it. And so that's how we see that. So the, this is kind of, um, we, 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 we cast this as shell expansion. It's also a kind of a way to say, these are the really important characters when you write shell scripts, the things to watch out for. So you can, you can kind of think of the, the, the different uh, uh, errors that you might have. Like you want to use double quotes around your 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 variables, uh, as you just saw the implications of. Uh, so unlike in R, in R you can interchange single quotes and double quotes. Okay, um, and those of you that have been doing stuff, you know, in data analysis research, you can see the implications of that, and you and you can use. Uh, uh, there is, there's sort of self escaped in a way inside of, I can, I can use single, if I'm using double quotes outside of my string, I use single quotes inside. If I'm using single quotes to define my string, I use double quotes inside. Um, can't, you can't do more nesting than that, but, but they function differently at the shell level. Because those single quotes shut everything off, double quotes, uh, uh, work differently as we saw there. Um, uh, a problem that you always have to be watchful for, I mean, not just in the shell, but uh, it's uh, almost in, in almost all areas of of programming, you're going to have to probably escape your special characters. In, in, so while the special, the magical characters in the shell in order to turn them off, you're going to have to escape them. Okay. And then especially like the, those, which are, which um, have implications. Um, the uh, spaces in file names and directories are just plain bad. Okay. And then, then the, the point here is when you're, when you're doing path name expression, be very careful about your your assumptions about whether there are spaces uh, in file names or not. Um, my advice, although this is sometimes this is going to be unavoidable, sometimes you're given directory names and, and directory names or file names, and they they may have spaces in them, so you have to deal with it. But if you have a choice, do not use spaces. Just don't do it. Um, if, if you insist on having something that looks like white space and use an underscore or a dash, don't use spaces. Or you just rename them as soon as I get a big space. Yeah, well, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, it, people, operating systems like, like Windows and Mac and Mac and Windows and Windows and Mac have really spoiled people into like, I'll just use a, I'll use a whole sentence to name this director. Uh, you know, I'll just, and and it uh, and it's not that um, it's not that Linux can't handle it. Linux can handle it, but it's a pain in the butt, and you have to use all sorts of strange symbology to deal with it. Why? Why do that? You could write a shell script which gets rid of all those spaces. You can write it. Actually, you can do it all in one line. Um, uh, another thing. So we, we haven't really talked about eval, but 
uh, eval is a, and, and we, we actually have a couple ways to do eval in R, uh, which I keep having to look up every time I do this, but um, it's a brain teaser how you, I'm going to construct a string and I want that string to actually be a command. Okay. Um, how do I, how do I take, I mean, maybe I put it in a variable. How do I actually execute this string as a command? And that is in most languages and most operating systems have something that's equivalent to eval, which is take what I'm giving you, the string I'm giving you and interpret it as a command and run it. And it, it can be really, uh, sometimes you have to do it, uh, but it can be very dangerous. And it can, you, you, so you have to be very careful of, about whether you, and why is it being mentioned here? Well, it's being mentioned here because all of this shell expansion stuff we're talking about is often used to kind of programmatically construct these, these string expressions. What you might, your, your reason for doing that might be to uh, construct a command that you want to ultimately execute at, at, in, in the shell. So it's just, you just have to be very careful and be very careful about the assumptions that you, that you put into it. Okay. Um, so here's a little example that uh, kind of puts all these different things together. Uh, this is, uh, again, this is, this is echo, but the idea here is how would I, how would I create this kind of programmatically create this, this mythical set of like backup TXT files that are uh, sort of date stamped in this particular way. And so, so let's, let's look at it kind of from the inside. So, here is, here's the actual command that's doing the date, and, it, and it's a formatted date. So if you type in this command, this date, and this format code, and, and those of you who have, have had to use date time or lubridate or whatever in R are familiar with like this notion of formatted date or people like Tom who are totally familiar with like C formatting, right? Formatted printing and formatting, whatever. Um, this is just a particular standardized way to format your, your month date in a particular way. So we want that in the middle of these file names, this set of file names that we're, we're creating. Okay, so we learned how to do that. We're going to put that in the middle of this string that we're building and then sort of like a, sort of like a paste zero, we're putting these things on either side, but look at this. This is really interesting. What do we have there? We've got that uh, that sequential, that curly brace uh, expansion that we had at the beginning, right there. So, so what this is going to do is is going to construct these uh, these uh, these sets, the set of, of file names uh, underscore one to underscore five. That is going to insert in each case uh, this this date stamp. And there's a lot of you know app applications that you can imagine of doing that. This little note that I have here is simply to remind that all I've done here is run this. You know, just generate this this string that I've that I've programmed in using shell expansion. There we go. So John, it's going to look for files with that timestamp. If I so if you have if, multiple copies of the, that file, it'll take the one with that. If well, yeah. So where where would I do something like this? Okay, you know, I I might in, instead of doing. Um, so all this is doing is generating. It's just sending to my standard output this set of names. This is not doing this, uh, this is not looking these up. It's just spewing out. Right, but it's appending right. the time, the, the date in seconds since the epoch, right? That, the That's correct. And and since I'm, so I'm doing, so uh, if I if I had higher precision, I don't know what it's gonna do by the time it gets to the end. I, I suspect it's actually going to just grab this 
and keep churning on this. You just mentioned get time. That, that, that's another way to get the number of seconds to see up. I guess. You know, I just remember that from the deep dark past. Or, or from we used to do uh, Linus, Linus Torvald's birthday. I don't know. Uh, well, but it was a date back in, well, 1970. The number of seconds in some date early before 2000, which has all changed now. Right. I think it's 1970. Yeah, so it might be. It does it for all time stamps and stuff like that. So we just use it to do to do uh, time code execution. <clears throat> get time at the beginning and the end, and just subtract the, the two numbers. And it goes the number of seconds, and then you'd have to go figure out the hour. I had a an internship this summer where they were keeping all the every data log that they were doing in uh, Epoch. So it was kind of annoying though because it's like I had to like doing dashboards doing graphs and I have to do the time and whatnot. And that's the only the big downside. You can't look at it. Like the same so thing. yeah, <laughs> if we if we've got time, I could show you this example of this. This um, there's this R app I built a couple of weeks ago for primarily for me and for our our cluster system manager Sean Collin. Um, you've you've heard me refer to Sean before, and basically it tracks. All the uh, all the the uh, all the R user R, R studio users on all of the R studio uh, nodes on the cluster and it plots it over time and it does it basically it samples I think every five minutes and it's and and we have the ability to just like um, did you know that the most active times of our our users are during our class on Wednesdays. And, and at midnight before homework is due, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, from midnight to about two in the morning, <laughs> and mostly on, on, on node one, mostly. But um, anyways, so but this is so you'd have to ask where uh, you know under what circumstance would you do this? But this is but. When you when you see a command, this is just the echo. What you might translate this into, maybe you translate that into a, an ls or or something, you know, some other command. Think about a more practical use of why you would do something like that. Maybe if I was actually creating a bunch of files at once, maybe I'm like initializing something. I, you you have to think um, when you're doing shell expansion, what would I be doing at the operating system level that would demand that I do something like this. Yeah, could you do like list and then that asterisk to see if all those types of files are like in there? You know what I mean? You can always do that. Okay. Yeah. 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 You, you could. You mean uh, in in what way? You do like ls. Put it before the quotes, so then you just see if all those different types of like unique file names are in the the. Oh oh oh! oh that's interesting. Yeah yeah. You could do exactly that. Okay. Cool. Yeah yeah. Uh, you could do. So yeah, let's think about what that. What that is. So, what David's suggesting is a thought experiment. If I replace ls with, um, I mean, replace echo with ls, what I'm essentially asking it to do is, uh, what I'm not sure about is what do you want? Well, let's somebody could do this experiment. Um, right. But it, uh, I believe what it should do is ls this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Okay, and it should do the ls for each one of the ones you've listed and tell you if those uh, are there or not. Okay, that would be a good example. Um, you could you could in my my little thought experiment, I was also thinking you could you could you could do a. Um, uh, You can do an eval and put like the LS inside of here, LS space backup in this stuff. And I think that would might work too, but that would be really scary to do. The, the preferred way to do it would be as, as David was suggesting, but you ought to be able to do that. Uh, so we should try it. Um, okay, so just kind of uh, uh, this is this is kind of tell them what I just said here. Um, it happens before you execute the, the commands. It's, it's not doing it like uh, it's, it's it's so it's expanding everything out before you actually do it. Um, 
echo is a, is a kind of a nice way to sort of test harness the stuff to check sanity, check things, look for things. Um, what do these different kinds of expansions uh, do? Uh, path name brace expansion, which is generating sets of now. One thing to when when we were um, when we were doing the brace expansion, like A to C and one to three, the one's not a number. Okay, that one's a string. Okay, um, and thinking about that. My actual answer to you possibly should have been, I don't know. No, because, because it might represent it if I have an A dot dot three. Maybe it thinks that there is some, maybe it goes from A to Z and then starts counting. I don't know. You know. So what, how does it represent? So that's worth an experiment. Um, Aaron shut his computer down. So oh, I tried that. It didn't work. If you did, if you did an echo, curly brace, a, yeah, a dot dot five. It just outputted curly braces a dot dot five. It said, "What are you doing?" It said, "Yeah, it didn't. It didn't expand it in any way." Yeah, it didn't interpret it as a sequence. Right. Okay. Um, not necessarily for the reasons that it, it it didn't see that as a valid sequence is what it did. Okay. Um, so, so it's like a for loop that breaks. Uh, you can well put it that way. Maybe I, I I think it's I it doesn't see it as a valid sequence. It's trying to construct a sequence and it just doesn't see it as a as a valid sequence that it can put together. Not so much that it breaks, but it's um, it doesn't even get there. It doesn't. You said that it, it echoed it back. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's not even recognizing it as a as an expression of a sequence. It's it's saying um, this what they've put inside the curlies is not valid a sequence. So I'm just going to echo it back. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same as saying echo Fred. It's just going to come back with Fred. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Okay, um, and at the end of this, there's you know, one of the great things about Linux stuff related to Linux is just about everything, like books and stuff like that, are uh, online you know, in, in in readable form, like manuals and that that are HTML or or a module of that that are available as um, PDFs. Uh, so. You've got these, and then this. Um, uh, there's this. I couldn't find this one, this actual book, the Linux command line. I, I didn't look very, very hard, but uh, I couldn't find this this William Schott's book um, online. However, there's a great site which is Learning the Shell, uh, which is online, and it goes into much, much greater detail. It goes into everything else. Uh, that you can imagine, um, and and there's there's other tools that kind of go hand in hand when you're um, when you're doing stuff on the shell, like grep, for example. You you might have encountered if you haven't encountered it at the Linux shell, you may have encountered it in your R program where they uh, the solution is to, to grep. I find grep insanely useful for for all sorts of things for finding. Uh, obscure, obscure strings in the bowels of massive files, uh, um, uh, and I, I've uh, commands like uh, sed, which is a, uh, what is it like a serial editor? What? I just remember it. Yeah. So you so you know you have the with with sed, so you can programmatically like. Here's an example that's applicable to R. Okay, let's say you've got like this, this uh, 10 megabyte CSV, okay, that you've just, you, you, you just created or you've got, okay, and you need to systematically uh, edit that. Well, it's something, it's something. You know, you, yeah, and maybe it's not, it's systematic, but maybe it's not 
maybe it takes some, you know, it, it occurs in circum certain circumstances. With SED, you can, uh, you can uh, create a search pattern and, uh, and, and offer a replacement and have it process that and furthermore, you could you could include this in in like a an outer script and do it on like a, a whole directory of files, okay? Uh, either from a command line, you create a little script to do it, and it's it's super powerful. And so, the, now why is why is this important to our people? Well, um, there there are some things that may be more efficient to do at the operating system level than in R. You know, most of what I just said, you could you could do in R. I would probably do them first in R because R's, you know, I, I'm better at R than I am at English, um, but that, which is pretty scary. <laughs> because, yeah. But the, uh, but you see my point is there, there's sometimes, uh, so, sometimes it makes more sense to, uh, or more convenient to whatever to do this stuff. But there's, there's other reasons to do it. Like you might have, um, this is where I'm going to see if I can pull up a uh, try to find can you see what I'm showing you okay so so this is a this is that app I was describing which is the um, the node one will never change. Most of them would stick. Well, it, it, it varies. So, so what, what I'm doing here is pretty frequently. So I'm, I'm running on each of the RStudio nodes on the cluster. I'm running a cron job, which is uh, tallying up the, the number of RStudio processes on each of the nodes. Okay, and I'm doing, each node is running essentially an identical little cron job, which is just going out. And it's, it's a, a tiny little shell script. And what I wanted to show you is not so much this, but I wanted to uh, try to show you um, I wanted to can you see it? All? I, I'll, I'll zoom into it when I get to the place I wanted to go. So on a do, you, do people know what a cron job is? Can you? Can you? So a cron job. So you, uh, cron jobs are actually you, you, you can have a, a set of commands which you can schedule to run at some interval. Uh, uh, if you want to do it every day, if you want to do it every minute, uh, uh, whatever it might be. And what? what uh, I, actually, I'm not going to. So what I first wanted to, if I could show, so I've got this, here, I'll go to this. So this is, this is the shell script that I run at, I don't know what it is, 10 minute intervals, five minute intervals, something like that. I've run this on every, Every uh, R Studio node, uh, whenever I've programmed that cron job at the operating system to fire, and what this is doing, and so shell script is a, it's just a simple text file that begins with this. Uh, uh, I think it's called shebang, the pound sign in there. That's and it, it says I'm using the bash shell. That's what we use in a cluster. It's called the bash shell. Um, and it's creating variables, just like we just like we said. Okay, it's using uh, substitution. I want the date in this format, which goes out to uh, minute resolution. So it's almost exactly the same as what I did. So it's saying uh, what I, I sort of didn't show you in detail was setting the date variable using this. So this says evaluate this. Boom, and make it equal to. Um, I've got another variable that's my separator. I've got another variable that I'm just giving it this info. This is actually the uh, the command that I want to have run. Okay, and it, you see, it's a kind of a compound. I've, I'm telling an operating system 
uh, PS dash AUX, which is just, it's just looking at all the, uh, the processes that are running. And then it's wrapping on uh, any session that's, that's uh, it's got our session in that text line. So when this command comes back with a bunch of lines that are uh, all, this, all the sessions that are running. So this comes back, this is how I execute it. And I execute it by instantiating the date variable, my separator variable, and, and this. And the result of doing that uh, at whatever interval I'm doing that is, uh, I have to find it here. Here we go. Can you guys see that very well? Um, I can make it, I think I can make it bigger. Um, I can just do it at the top too. The WebEx thing. Oh, but it's a different reader. So I'm running, I've got this set up to this. Um, this is kind of the beauty of the cluster, okay? Is that the cron job is running on each of the nodes separately. So I, I, on each each of the R Studio nodes, I've set it up on a, a, a separate cron job. You don't have like one cron job running across all of them. You get separate separate cron jobs, and depending upon which node it is, um, I think it. I think that the idea is being set by. I think the idea is actually being set by the, the how I call this in the cron. I think a parameter or something, but each of these CSV files. Uh, is is simply a it's a single column file that's got actually must be date and default it's got date and account okay um, that's due to let's import the data set we see its structure this is what happened and so you can see when it started back in September and and all my my cron job is doing is just on each of these nodes it's just taking at the end of the thing this little job so it's running this tiny little shell script that's being invoked by this cron job over and over and over and over again and then my 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 actual R studio or my my shiny app is just stupidly simple it just reads in like six or whatever many five or six one two or five five different csvs and it makes a uh gg plotly thing and and displays and then the the shiny app itself is kind of funky because it it'll actually update while it's it's got a timer in it so i just sit or have it open so anyways that's that, that's meant to be like the little practical application of of doing this stuff. So, now John, this is all Linux, but um, or Linux. Certain amount of the stuff is available in Windows. Um, I suppose. I don't know what Alfred and Path certainly work. Uh, there's some CD, uh, but PIR and stuff LS. And I, I have never tried it at the command line, but Tilde works in file names. If you're running R in Windows, you have Tilde in, in your file name. It, it's perfect. Meaning your path? The path, yeah. I don't oh. know whether it works just use it for some other reason on the command line. Because I mean we just we use that all the time for, for, for file range, right? And yeah, there's so there's something thought, um, thought in front of it too. So I I don't want to I I think there I think uh Hawk was another one. Well, I think R so, so I think the answer to that is I think R has a clue when it comes to how that stuff is dealt with. Um normally I'm I I don't answer and I'm offended by Windows related R questions. <laughs> but I don't um but I, I think it I think it's due to that. So it's it, it it's able to handle paths. 
in different ways. And that's and in, in, in all seriousness, there's a, there's a big interoperability issue that you have because part of because R is not meant to just be run on, on Linux. Okay, R is R is meant to be cross-platform. And if you don't have an elegant way to handle paths, right. Um, no, Tom, I have an offering and a present for you. I have a book that is totally dedicated to said and walk. Yeah. 300 pages. Nothing but said and walk. If I can find it on my bookshelf, I'll bring it in. You know, that, that reminds me, what is it? What's it? Lex and Yak? Oh, yeah. Lexical parser and something else. It's like I'm talking literally 40 years ago. So, anyways. Um, any, any, what, yes. Uh, so you know how you said double quotes prevent some kind of shell expansions and not others? Is that kind of what, I guess, what kind of rules are that? Or are they, is it like going to be different on different versions so of Bash or anything? I, I think the right answer to that question is use, use uh, the, the single quotes when you're sure that you want to prevent it. And double quotes, use them when you want to, like wrap variables, like, like quote dollar home. I don't know, I don't know the situation. You can't, I can't think of the, the situation because that question kind of went through my mind as I was reviewing this stuff. Like, when, when are single quotes and double quotes actually doing the same thing? Because, because the ex the examples of the double quotes were all positive examples of when you when you want to use them, okay. But I didn't see any. I'm not sure. If, um, and I I know I know when you don't want to use them, you don't want to use them when you want to be using those single quotes. You, you know, so you, so I th I think the answer to that is sort of I don't know of a case where it's actually turning it off. So I guess one negative example that I found on my machine, but I probably not true from what you were testing was um the like zeros dot dot five like that kind of expansion gets shut off whereas the other ones would stay but uh the the sequence the curly brace thing yeah the um, sequence curly brace so you're saying you're saying if you did echo double uh, double quote curly brace zero dot dot five curly brace double quote you're saying that doesn't expand to a sequence of numbers at least with the version of bash that i'm running yes what is it we need a dollar sign or? but that what we did but but the example i showed where where i had the sequence do one to five because because that did expand in that example that i did well that was what i was interested by i assumed that you tested that but oh. example didn't work on mine so i was wondering if it was a version difference or something i don't know if it's a version um, um example with the uh like backup oh version. you know what you know jake could be right that could be the that could be the uh, testing thing it might you know that in the beginning of the slides where i talked about that that dot txt example where I, and I said those files had to exist. And um, that was a, a thing that was kind of peculiar, a surprise to me because that echo command, rather than generating those things, was acting like an LS, okay? That might be actually the problem that you're seeing. I, maybe, I don't know. Um, but um, what happens if you do it without the quotes? Oh, it just expands. It does expansion. Yeah. But if you put it in double quotes, it doesn't expand. Yeah. Um, I could try I, making a file that has the number. You could you could try that. Just just a, like a, a stupid little file that is like a what would it be like a one? <laughs> be a file named one. Uh, doesn't seem too effective, but so I'm not sure about that. But that's an excellent question. Is is Bash pretty much? Crowded out all the other different shells. Still, well, C shell. I'm just well. Well, I, there's another one that is um, sort of the one that's more common on like the Red Hat 
So Bash is kind of uh, uh, Ubuntu. It's, it's the default on Ubuntu. But, um, you know, we had like for a while, I, I think on the cluster were Bash all the way across. But um, I think when they first set up the cluster, we actually had a different shell on something. But I'm not I'm not sure about that. But I remember board shell and bash is the board again shell, right? Yes. And then C shell was a very early one that I remember. Yeah. So the short answer is other shells are used. Um in our environment, it's um on the cluster, it's all bash. Um depending upon what distro of if you've got it uh, installed in your personal machine, well, you may or may not, depending upon what distro you're using. I don't, you know, I know that Ubuntu, Mint, which is basically Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Those are, that's the default shell for, for this operating system, but you can always invoke your own. Yes, you can. You can. That's right. Um, and I, and you might even be able to, if you've got the other ones installed, you could, you remember that shebang that's at the head of the, the shell script? You can specify a different shell. Sure. Um, and if you look at that, it's actually the way it's specifying the, the shell is it's doing by a uh, path to that shell. So you could you could ask it to do a different shell. Um, and if you do so, the shell expansion stuff may or may not work. It probably will work because I think that's that stuff is pretty standard. But all right. I got one more question. Yeah. So in this data frame uh, for this date column. So uh, for the date column, just at the end, we have like 15, 20, 25, but we are missing a 30. Why is that? I, I think I'm not getting it. Like, oh, I see what he's talking about. The last two digits. I don't know. It's like 15, 20, 25, but we are missing a 30. So the maybe it's just curious. I was curious why. It's okay. Sense. So what file is this? So that would have been 15 minutes after I wrote my first script. Oh, okay. Literally, literally 15 minutes after I, 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 okay. this thing ever ran. So who knows what happened? Okay. Um, and and that you're, you're talking about like the the fifth, the fourth line out of a file that is, um, yeah, right, 300 kilobytes long. 